Hello, everybody. How are you? Good. Welcome. As I look around the room tonight, I see what we always love to see, which is a nice combination of new faces, old faces, folks who've been here before, young musicians, older musicians, icons, former uh, Harlem Speaks guests, and all told members of the Jazz Museum and Harlem family. So I'm humbled and honored that you're all here. My name's Lawrence Schoenberg. I'm the executive director of the Jazz Museum in Harlem. Thank you. And on behalf of my board of directors and my co-director, Christian McBride, will be speaking to you through the miracles of modern technology in just one moment, because he's in Wisconsin but didn't want to miss it tonight. I'd like to welcome you very much for coming and enjoy your, your presence here tonight. If you look on the walls around you, uh, these photographs are photographs of what we've been up to, among other things, for the last three or four years, which is this Harlem Speak series. In the audience tonight, we have some of our former honorees, a historian, dancer who danced at the Apollo Theater and is the subject of our new educational initiative starting at the Frederick Douglass Academy starting this coming Saturday. Uh, I'd like to introduce Taja and Jackie Murdoch right here. <laughs> Distinguished teacher, author, bassist with all the greats, and a uh, man involved in the political and the educational and the musical end of jazz for a lot longer than most of us. We're honored tonight to have Mr. Larry Ridley here. <laughs> Another aspect of our series at Harlem Speaks has been having folks who are not in the music business, but for whom jazz and Harlem have played a never-ending role in their lives. And one of the outstanding examples of that is the head of the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone, who long before that came along is the lifelong jazz, jazz man, Mr. Ken Knuckles. I'd also like to introduce my two partners here. One is the co-producer of Harlem Speaks, a radio host, a writer about politics, a magazine editor, publisher, and many other things, Mr. Greg Thomas. And uh, when folks ask about the Jazz Museum and what it is, I mean, we're, we're about to be designated, we hope, for a location to actually build a museum. In the meantime, this is our home. This is where we do everything from. It's pretty much the only full-time staff is myself and the other half of my museum heartbeat, Miss Wilhelmina Grant, who everyone knows. Her. So before we start the interview, I'd like to introduce my co-director through the miracles of modern technology. I think he's in Madison, Wisconsin, Christian McBride. Christian? Hello, am I on? Yes, sir. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Greetings to all my family and friends back in Harlem. I am so sad I can't be there to join you guys tonight, but uh, you're going to have so much fun there with the uh, living legend himself. And uh, I send all my love and all my best, and I will see you guys in a couple of weeks at the uh, next problem speaks, but for now, you guys enjoy yourselves tonight and uh, take all that inspiration that you're gonna get tonight and do something positive with it. And all my love from, let's see, where am I? Um, <laughs> Lafayette, Indiana. There's <laughs> not, not a whole lot of soul out here, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it through tonight. <laughs> All the best. Thanks, Christian. <laughs> and now to the subject of tonight's presentation. We're honored tonight to be in the presence of, uh, I guess the best way to put it is musical royalty. And this, our guest for this evening, as you all know, is one of the most important, innovative, creative, fountain of youth musicians in the history of the music whose career spans several decades. And to interview him tonight, I'm happy to turn it over to a dear friend of mine, a great musician who you all know, but who has a background in radio and is one of the most historically knowledgeable musicians I know. And I'm so happy to introduce your host for this evening, our interviewer, Mr. Lewis Nash. And I just have two more words to say, ladies and gentlemen. Roy Haynes. Right. Well, 
I just stand up? <laughs> Why do you just... It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. Why they stand up? Why? Do you all stand up for everybody? No. First time. No. This is an exception. First time. Really? Really. First time. really? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roy. Um, and welcome, everyone. Thank you, Lauren, for your introduction. And, um, indeed, he's uh, correct in saying that we're uh, graced with royalty this evening because um, Mr. Roy Haynes is here among us. And... Uh, took the time out of his busy schedule to come and share a couple of hours with us and uh, have conversation with us and uh, share some of his uh, <laughs> memories and uh, <laughs> recollections and all kinds of things. So uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to be here to interview Roy for many reasons, uh, not the least of which is that I play the same instrument that he does and um, have been uh, as long as I've been involved in playing music, or at least playing jazz, I've been influenced by Roy's approach to the drums, his conceptual way he deals with the instrument has been a big influence on my own view of music and of the instrument. So a personal thanks to you, Roy, and I'm sure from every drummer, aspiring and otherwise, is in the audience, we all owe a debt of gratitude to you for your innovations and uh, your uh, the way you deal with our instrument. So, thank you very much for that. Um, a little background. This is this is not the first time that uh, I've had an opportunity to be in an interview type situation with Roy. And the reason I'm sharing this little story with you before we actually get into the interview is to give you a little background on... Um, how I first uh, got a little peek into Roy's personality at that first interview session. This was 1996, and Modern Drummer at that time wanted to do a story on Roy, and they picked me as one of the younger drummers who um, they would like to pair Roy with and do a double, uh, 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 dual interview, I guess you'd call it. And I happen to, you still have that magazine, Roy? Probably. <laughs> In any case, um, this is the cover from night. It actually came out in January 1997. We did the interview in 1996. The title of the um, story is called Two Generations of Hip. Now, I can't vouch for my own hipness, but I can guarantee you that Roy Haynes is still super hip. Um, and the reason I brought this magazine uh, to share this one story, here's another, a couple of photos from the inside of Roy and I. But um, we, we went into this session, I don't know if you remember this, Roy, we started, we sat down, kind of got comfortable, and the guy who was doing the interview, his name was Ken McAuliffe. And um, so we sit down, get comfortable. First thing he says is, uh, the first question out of his mouth is, uh, the first words is, it's been said that in the old days, now he's addressing both Roy and me. It's been said that in the old days, the great players could be recognized by their individual sound on the instrument. Do you think that today's younger players have as strong a musical identity as the players of the past? Now, he looked at me and I said, that would be hard for me to answer since I wasn't there in those days like Roy was. And a big smile came on Roy's face. So the guy says, uh, Ken says, what do you think, Roy? <laughs> Roy says, looks at me, not him. And Roy says, first of all, Lewis, when exactly did you come to New York? <laughs> so I told him 1979, 80. And, um, he, and we kind of laughed. And, he's, and then Roy says, what sign are you? And I say, Capricorn. And Roy says, oh, yeah? And then the, the interviewer says, what sign are you, Roy? Roy says, wait a minute, I'm not through with him. <laughs> You don't remember all that, so, so it's all in here. If you can find it. So Roy says um, to me, ask me how old I, I am. At that time, I was 37. So um, it's about 10 years ago. So he said um, to the interviewer, Ken, this is Roy speaking. So when you ask a question like that, here's a young man pointing to me. 
uh, Roy says, I'm 71, and you asked the question to both of us like we were the same age. That's a little odd, isn't it? Uh, you asked the question like we started at the same time. So he says, I didn't mean to dis be disrespectful. So Roy says, it's not disrespectful, it's, it, it just doesn't fit. It puts me in an odd position. It's a good thing that Lewis declined the question. So I, I had no idea that that would be your response, but that gave me a little bit of insight into how focused Roy Haynes could be on details, and, and the, the focus of that question was off. And uh, fortunately, I knew to decline. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, that was uh, our first meeting in this kind of situation. Of course, um, I've had the opportunity, as many of you have, to listen to Roy on recordings, to see him play live. Some of you have known Roy since uh, before I was around. And, um, uh, you know, it makes me think, in interviewing you, Roy, you know, my, my own father, my natural father, is 79. He'll be 80 next year. And, um, born in 1926. And um, so it, one of the things that I always like to share with um, the younger musicians, or actually anyone who will listen, but particularly the younger musicians who I may have interaction with, is that part of the beauty of being in the music and being able to be around people like Roy is not just to get the musical information, but to be around them as human beings, to get to know them as people. Asking Roy a little bit about family, um, as we want to not only talk about music, but talk about Roy the man. And Roy, I'd like for you to um, talk to us a little bit and tell us uh, about your roots, and maybe we can start by your birth date and where you were born. Well, it's all right. It's fine. I know it. <laughs> oh, boy. First of all, you speak so well. <laughs> and I didn't know that you had been involved in radio. Is that what he said? Well, what happened was uh, in, in my uh, college days, I was a broadcast journalism major, not a music major, but... Um, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here he goes again. <laughs> I had, uh, you know, watching guys like Max Robinson and the early days, and uh, I thought I wanted to do that. You know, like, oh, like you that. really sound good. <laughs> Thank you. I'm serious. So, uh, starting with me, uh, probably most of you know that I'm from Boston, and I've been in New York since 1945. You know, interesting thing, when I was getting out of the car, this gentleman comes over with a photo of me when I was a teenager, and he told me that Charlie Holmes gave him that photo, and I signed it to him. Charlie Holmes was an alto saxophone player that played with Louis Armstrong, and he's the one that recommended me to Louis Russell. Mm. And this is all, I mean, that's weird, right? Yeah. And he has the photo of me. Uh, can you bring up that photo, sir? Al? Al Bomber? Uh, Al? When I was a teenager. Here he is. Oh, there he is. You can just hand it to me, you don't have to come up. Look at that. Wow. Now this looks, you know, I knew it looks. Can you do this for a minute? Could, would you mind doing that for a minute? Thank you. you better catch me, Chris. Fast. You got me? No, I didn't. I'll hold it for it. I'll hold Thank it for Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Boy, that looks like your grandson, Mark. He, he, really? looks, he looks a lot like you. How about uh, that? Somebody said my grandson is here who's a teenager, and he's, <laughs> he's one of the reasons why I'm talking now and not playing okay, as much as it. I used to. Thank you. <laughs> now, Marcus, where are you? Right here. Uh, last month would have been 60 years, September 1945, is when I come to New York on a train, one way train ticket from Boston that Lewis Russell sent me. And recommended by Charlie Holmes, who played alto with a lot of people. Uh, the way he handled me the picture, I thought he was still living, you know. But he's been gone quite a while. So, uh, 
Roy, when you came in 1945, was that the first time you had come to New York, or had you come before that? I, I had come before that, but I didn't uh, come to play. I just came to listen. I had a brother. He was stationed in Jersey uh, in the Army. And my father and my sister-in-law, we came on the train. That was the first time coming to New York. It excited me. Oh, man. Uh, 52nd Street, that's one of the first places I went with my brother. And it was like a dream. So anyhow, back to, uh, you have to excuse me because when you're a senior citizen, sometimes you forget where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Even in the music. <laughs> and I forget where the hell I am. And, uh, so why am I telling you the story? Where was I? We wanted to know about your, your roots, roots? Your, your family, your I mother and father, your mother and father. Where are they from? Barbados. Barbados. Everybody knows I'm a Bajan. Descent. Uh, and sibling, you have. You mentioned your brother. I don't know if you had other. I had uh, three brothers. Mm -hmm. I got one left, Michael Haynes. He's pretty big up in uh, Boston now. He was the minister of Twelfth Baptist Church in Roxbury. That's where Martin Luther King and his wife, even before they were married, used to go to his church. He just retired, but he's still. He saw you the other night. Oh. In Boston, and he said, "Man, you broke it up." Wow. Yeah, I that's, didn't get a chance to meet him. I'm sorry. Well, that's my brother Michael, a couple of years younger than me. Uh next. And uh, okay, so <laughs> now let's talk a little bit about growing up. And were you born? Now I've read different things in bios, and I know they're not the information is not always correct in the bios. But were you born actually in Roxbury or in Boston? Well, Rushbury is part of it's Boston. It's a part of Boston. Yeah, it's like, you know, Harlem. More like Harlem now than it was then. I see. Uh, 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 okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> what was it like uh, growing up in the, I guess it would have been the 30s when you were a youngster and then in your teens and that in that area? What was it like for you? Uh, it was really great. You know, growing up in Roxbury, like I was saying, was uh, like the UN. I often say that because... Uh, my father bought a house very early, and on one side of us were French Canadians, the other side was Miss Kelly, Irish. Across the street was a Jewish synagogue. Then in the block, there were a lot of you know blacks from the south and different places, so I had that mixture from day one, and, you know. And it was great growing up, man. I loved it. Now, did you ever have an opportunity to go to Barbados as a child? Uh, no, the last... 15, 20 years, I'm going a lot. When I was very young, I didn't get there. Oh, okay. And you have relatives there? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Great. In fact, my brother has a couple condos, so I go down, hang out quite a bit, drink a little rum, <laughs> sit by there, see, you know, reminisce. <laughs> um, now, we're tying in Harlem and uh, into all of this, of course. and. Um, just as an aside, there was another gentleman around Roxbury and Boston in the 30s who ended up becoming a son of Harlem, so to speak, and make his name uh, around the world and in New York. Uh, have any idea who I might be talking about? Uh, what instrument did he play? He was not a musician. I didn't know you were going to quiz me like that. Let's see, from Roxbury and... He wasn't from there, but he did, uh, during his teens, he spent a lot of time in Boston, Roxbury. He was originally from Michigan. Oh, hmm. Malcolm Little. Oh, he was from Detroit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he was in uh, Roxbury around in the late 30s. Oh, yeah, well, his... Did you ever uh, have any encounters with, with him? I'm sure he came to a lot of uh, a lot of the early dances that I was playing because mm -hmm. you know my brother knew him. Mm -hmm. uh, but when he had broke away from Elijah Muhammad, he was having uh, some meetings up at the Audubon, bro. That's right. And I went. I was up there, so he knew about the Haineses in Boston. Oh, okay. and I never did get a chance to really rap with him. In That's fact, right. I was there two weeks before that he got shot there. And uh, he started to leave after he had finished stalking. He went downstairs. You know, the Audubon Ballroom has a lot of stairs going way up. And he came running back upstairs and says, I don't want you all to leave the same time I'm leaving because there may be some shooting or something. And uh, he told everybody to stay upstairs, and he came down. 
and uh, I think it was the next week or the next couple of weeks this one got off. Mm. But Shorty and uh, there was a friend of his who was a friend of mine. In fact, his Shorty was Malcolm Jarvis, I think his name was. And somebody knows, huh? <laughs> Larry Ridley. And Malcolm had a song that uh, had two songs that Larry Ridley is here. And he used to play bass uh, with a group I had for a long time. We were in Providence, Rhode Island, and and uh, Shorty's son came. Yeah. Malcolm's son. What was his name? He had one son that played drums. Yeah, Cl uh, Clifford. Clifford Jarvis. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Clifford Jarvis was one son of uh, Malcolm Jr. And Malcolm Jr. was the other one. Yeah. Okay. So okay. we were pretty close there. Right. And then, as you know, the replacement of uh, Malcolm was. Uh, Falcon, who was from Roxbury also. Right, right. Our families uh, knew each other, I don't think. Anyhow, enough of that. Let's get back to the music. Right. Yeah, great. Nice, <laughs> nice aside there. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit while we're on the subject of Harlem. Uh, when you came here that first time, uh, I'm sure it was all we've, those of us who are my age and younger, all we've heard about because uh, I'm sure, it, uh, you know, Harlem is, is uh, historically speaking, has so much uh, wonderful history from that period. Uh, not that there isn't now, there's still beautiful things going on, but we that's kind of a heyday, kind of a glory period, I guess, if you had to say that. And would you share with us some of your first impressions of Harlem when you first came here? <laughs> you know, what was that like? Well, Harlem, from first time coming here, which would have been uh, very early, I'm trying to think exactly what year it was, uh, like 43. It's probably 43 or 44. Uh, I had never been to Paris, but when I would get to a, like 7th Avenue with the wide sidewalks, I felt like I was in Paris and never had been to Paris. But Harlem, just, I mean, from day one, it, I loved it. Still, in fact, we're on 126th Street now mm -hmm. between Park and Lexington. 126th and 8th Avenue was like the mecca of the entertainment world for black people. 126th Street, you could see anybody. There was a bar, there was a hotel called the Hotel Braddock, 126th, and then around the corner was the Braddock Bar. There were two bars. Bars were very big in Harlem. I mean, they took most of the bars out, you know. In fact, they when I say they, I, I know who I'm talking about, but I don't know who I'm talking about. They uh, done the same thing in all of our Harlems in our country. They used to have a lot of jazz clubs in all the neighborhoods. They took all of that, all the hotels, they just ripped it up. And it's, it's really strange, you know, when you come to places like Harlem, now they say the new Harlem. But, wow, you gotta have a lot of imagination <laughs> to, you know, to compare it to what it was. Uh, I remember once, uh, October 1946, I was at 126th and 8th Avenue just hanging out. And Louis Armstrong's band was getting ready to go down south. The bus was there. I said, oh, Roy Haynes, our drummer is sick. We need a drummer. So I took the bus back up to Amsterdam Avenue, 149th Street and got my little bag, got back on the bus, and came back to 126th Street, and went with Louis Armstrong's big band uh, down south. I remember Roanoke, well not Roanoke, Virginia, we played uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and a lot of tobacco warehouses and that whole thing. So when I come to 126th Street, I mean the memories of the, that whole period, even though it wasn't on the east side, it was more, you know, west side, eighth Avenue. But, uh, I enjoy, I'm always in Harlem, even now. <laughs> Come to Harlem, hang out. A lot of the bars, they took my last favorite bar away, which was called the Gold Brick on Amsterdam Avenue. <laughs> I'd go in there, everybody with no Roy hands. You know, I could just go, I could go in there and relax and don't worry about uh, anything. And all of that seems to be gone. Sometimes, you know, I'll go to one place, somebody know me. Was that too much? No. It's <laughs> There's a, now you mentioned 126, there was, where was the corner, was that the corner where people, would, the musicians would go to 
find work. I, I keep hearing about a place where musicians would gather in a particular corner. I figure, uh, I think I remember someone saying 126 and 8, but I'm not sure if that's correct or not. Well, uh, that could have, but that's where a lot of the musicians met. I don't know if they were to always... To discuss you. Yeah, were well, gigs. that was the hangout. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the older players really did, uh, they used to hang out in the bars, you know, most of the players, mm -hmm. and everybody drank it. I got a telegram one time, I think it was from Pete Brown. He was an alto saxophone player. And I used to play with him when he would come to Boston a lot when I was very young. And I think he sent me a telegram and told me to meet him there. That's the first time I had went. I, I saw so many musicians, man, I went crazy about I mean, all the great players, you know, you could see Duke Ellington, everybody, Basie, and all the members of the bands, Andy Kirk's band, and they had a lot of bands back in, the, in that period. Uh, it, was, it was a very exciting uh, corner. And your first uh, <coughs> professional uh, gig here in in New York was in Harlem at the South, at the uh, Savoy Ballroom. Is that correct? That's with correct. Louis Russell. With Lewis Russell. With Lewis Russell. And what year was that? 1945. That was September of 1945. Uh, we went into the Apollo shortly after that. You know. Uh, uh, can can I I ask a Who did you replace in Russell's band? With Lewis Russell. Mm -hmm. Percy Bryce. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I never, that's the first time I think I was ever asked that question. Percy's still living, he's still around. Always a great player. That's the first time I was ever asked who did I replace. <laughs> wow. That's heavy, he stopped me. <laughs> I didn't stop and think about that one. <laughs> so I, I played, you know, I played with Bird, I played with, and, and, well, you know, I replaced Max with Bird. But I mean, this guy went back to 1945, food it up a place. And he's writing it down, too. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was headed someplace. Where was I headed? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm trying to think of this drummer's name. He died maybe five years ago. He used to play with Lucky Millinder. How? What's your animal? Panama. 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 And I really get 10 points. <laughs> Panama Francis told me many years later, you know, after I became an older guy, that when I came to New York with Lewis Russell, a lot of drummers would hang out, you know, when we, when we were going into the Apollo Theater. A lot of the experienced, experienced drummers would hang out there if the drummer couldn't play the show. Naturally, he would get axed and they would have to use one of the drummers. So Panama said, when I came in, and, you know, after I played a little bit, all the drummers got together and said, well, you all might as well go home. <laughs> <laughs> this little guy ain't getting fired. <laughs> but I, I remember the first day, I was nervous as hell, you know, playing all those shows. But I used to check out a lot of the great show drummers in that whole thing, you know, and learn a lot. You know, Who were some of the drummers, the drummers you might have heard in those days? Man, there were a lot of them. A lot of them were yeah. not. Uh, my old, I had an older brother that used to work on the railroad, so he would come from Boston, come to New York. He'd always tell me about the different bands. They have the battles of the bands at the Savoy, and tell me who's doing what. And when I really wanted to quit school, my brother says, where are you going, to New York? He said, the drummer's there greater than Joe Jones. That <laughs> changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's where he, he said, man, there's some drummers greater than Joe Jones. So. I met a lot of those drummers. I don't know if they were greater than Joe Jones, but they were great, and they invented a lot of stuff. They were, oh man, there was so many of them. You met Chick Webb? Uh, uh, Chick Webb was gone. He was before. gone by the time you got him? He was gone. But I met him on that record, Liza. <laughs> Anyone hip to Liza? Mm -hmm. uh, Chick Webb? Yeah. How's it go? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's the song. Yeah, that's the <laughs> Funny thing, I did a, a question and answer thing in uh, University of Maryland a couple weeks ago, and I asked some. Somebody talked about uh, a record that I recorded with Stan Getz. Uh, I'm late. I'm late. Yeah. Focus. Oh, yeah. And somebody mentioned. I said, "How's it going?" And they all sang it. It really knocked me out, man. <laughs> so, now, some of the, the. I see some people raise their hands. We, I'm, we're going to get to all the questions, but I think. Format-wise, we want to save those for the second half. What we're going to do is have this conversation with Roy for uh, another half hour, I guess, or so. They're about to take a 15-minute break. And then when we come back for the second half, have all your uh, questions ready, because we'll, we'll get to them now. I want to make sure we don't get to how many minutes? Ten minutes break. Anyway, um, now, Roy, we're, we're still in Harlem. Now, uh, 
let's talk about some of the, you've mentioned some of the musicians you've met and played with, great uh, musicians, uh, Charlie Parker, Dizzy, Lester Young, uh, Bud Powell, Thelonious Monk. What are your first recollections of, you know, coming here and meeting these musicians and having an opportunity to play with them? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, you know, my hangout was uh, 52nd Street and Minton's Playhouse. There was a drummer by the name of Teddy Stewart. We were the same age. He was from Kansas City. So we came to New York almost the same time. He was with Buddy Johnson and I was with Lewis Russell. And he told me one night, he said, Haynes, you haven't been to Minton's yet? So I started going to Minton's. And that was a kick. Uh, I'm trying to think of the drummer that used to play it. Used to be house drummer. What? Kenny Say that loud? Kenny Clark. Uh, no, the Kenny Clark was in the Army when I got to New York, I think. <coughs> he came around a little later. Yeah, I think he was in Paris or somewhere, anyhow. There's another drummer. This drummer used to have a tailor shop on 126th Street. He was a real New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, he was a house drummer. And on Monday nights, that's when they used to have the jam sessions. They used to give the musicians uh, free food. You have biscuits, you know, you have that whole thing. Uh, and the drummers, you, <coughs> is that my cue? <laughs> 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 Are we all right now? I just want to say from Boston, May Arnett, Jimmy Sly, said hello. And I Give me a slide. Yes, Thanks you are. <laughs> <laughs> right, I had to come by to see you. All right. <laughs> okay, it's nice okay. to see you. <laughs> She's a dancer, a tap dancer. Yeah. Jimmy Slide's going to be in town. Somewhere I'm hearing. Yeah, he's supposed to. <laughs> we hope he'll show up. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Where was it? Uh, 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 Milton's Playhouse. Oh, Milton's Playhouse. That was, oh man. That was it. Um, and they had a million drums that would want to play, you know. What was the when was the first occasion you had to meet Bird and Dizzy? Uh, you know, uh, Dizzy knew my brother anyhow, so uh, I guess on Fifty Second Street. I don't remember. I was never introduced to Charlie Pop. See, in those days, you weren't necessarily introduced if you had something to say on your instrument. People knew about you. And I spent two years with uh, Lester Young, and I'm sure uh, Charlie Parker may have heard me with Lester Young. But uh, hmm, I joined him, Charlie Parker, 1949, I think it was. I was playing on 52nd Street, because I was with Miles' group. We had a gig in Brooklyn. And after that gig was over, Max Roach, who was king in Brooklyn, not only Brooklyn, but he was really king in Brooklyn. Max Roach, he was king all over, but Brooklyn, Max Roach was king. <laughs> <laughs> so he, this was a place called Soldier Myers on Sutter Avenue. And after Miles, I think Max got a group together. So Max was working with Charlie Parker. So Max came to me and asked me if I would take his place with Charlie Parker. And I was having big fun across the street. They were, they were playing the Three Deuces. I'm in another club called the Onyx. I was with Bud Paul and uh, I think Sonny Still or somebody else. The same group that Miles had. We were company in uh, Bud Paul. So Max Roach came over and asked me uh, maybe twice if I would join Charlie Parker. I didn't respond. Then Charlie Parker came over the next night himself. That's when I responded. I said, no problem. <laughs> so, you know, and it was like he knew me all the time. You know. Mm. Well, before we get too far past this period, I want to just backtrack a little bit to Lester Young. Yeah. You talked about him before he played with Charlie Parker. Could you just um, briefly give us a little bit of your impression of the, the time you spent with Lester Young? Uh, it was precious. Perez, he was, he was a funny guy. I mean, you'd be laughing all day on the bandstand and wherever. Wasn't making any money at all, and they were taking our tax. But I didn't mind. I did two years, and I did save some money, you know, to pay down on an automobile, which was out of style for musicians in those days, you know. 
So, uh, in fact, the same week, Miles and I both bought a car. We didn't even know. We both we, and we raced with those cars in Central Park late at night. <laughs> get tickets, smash the cars up. <laughs> so, um, what was that? What was the question? I'm talking about Young. <laughs> oh, <Lester. laughs> so, my first game with Lester was at the Savoy Ballroom in Harlem. After I left Louis Russell, I went with Lester Young. And Lester used to call everyone else Prez. You know, I guess that's how we got the nickname Prez, because he called everyone else Prez. After I played about two tunes, he came over to the drums, said, you sure are swinging, Prez. If you have eyes, the gig is yours. And I stayed with him until he went with Norman Grass's Jazz, the Philharmonic. And then I went to 52nd Street. So the memories of that whole period, you know, it was around this time, you know, it was October of 1947 that I joined Prez. It was great. For me, it's just, I mean, you know, to hear these these stories are pretty fantastic. To to sit here with Roy and uh, reminisce even a little bit because, uh, as you can imagine, the the gentlemen you were t you were talking about are basically names and historical figures to me. I didn't have a chance to meet them, and many of us of my age and even older never met. But they're um, still my our heroes and uh, icons in the music. And uh, whenever we have a chance to to uh, sharing some of these stories with folks who were actually there. This is what I was talking about before for the young musicians. It really helps to give you an insight into more than just what you hear on a record or how they play patterns or how the, what the, these are human beings who had full lives and all the things that we experience in our lives. So it's, it, I always love to hear the personal sides of, uh, from these musicians. Uh, Okay, Roy, now after, uh, we're going to condense just a bit the, the period here we're talking about in the late 40s in Harlem and, and in New York City, playing with uh, all these giants. Let's talk a little bit about Monk. I'm not sure if you played much with Monk in that period or if that came a little later, but um, he's certainly one of the uh, musicians who was unique in the music, and I'd like to get a little bit of your take on Monk first hearing him and being around him in those days? Uh, uh, I think Monk was with Cootie at one time, was he? I think that's... Either I met him with Cootie or he was with uh, Coleman Hawkins. See, living in Boston, which is only a couple hundred miles from New York, a lot of the musicians would come there, I would meet them. Like, I met Kenny Clark when he was playing with Red Allen at a very early age, you know. And... Um, I think I met Monk uh, when he was with Coleman Hawkins. I think so. Which would have been early in Boston. You know. And Denzel Best was the drummer. You know, Denzel was a trumpet player, and I think he had uh, TV or something, and he started playing drums. And he didn't play a lot of solos, but uh, everyone's familiar with Denzel Best? Yeah. 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 I don't hear too much about him. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, not long after that, uh, we we're into the. I guess we can move on into the 50s now. No? Um, if the uh, uh, information is correct, you uh, joined Sarah Vaughan in the early 50s and stayed with her for several years. And um, uh, we'd like to hear you s reflect on that period of your life. I imagine that's probably the same period where you started your family and all of that, so we can delve into some other areas besides music too, but uh, uh, this would be the early 50s, I suppose, right? Uh, that's when I joined Sarah, mm -hmm. early 50s, but I didn't start families till uh, the late, later 50s. Oh, okay. Yeah. That I know about anyhow. After playing with after playing on Fifty Second Street uh, with all of this uh, music that was moving and shaking the world and whatnot, it um, uh, it must have been a little bit different to even though the great Sarah Vaughan, it still wasn't playing with Bird and Dizzy. So, what, what talk a little bit about the, the difference of why why you um, uh, not necessarily why, but what it was like, and uh, okay, okay, I, I, I got you. Yeah, <laughs> I got you. Uh, that's a good question, because I've been thinking the last couple of days, 
In the morning, I usually listen to KCR when I, when I wake up early. And Phil has been doing a thing with, uh, from 40, 1945 period with Dizzy and Bird, and they had recorded with Sarah Vaughan, and Max was on that as well. And uh, the last few days since I've been back in town, I've been hearing Phil talk about that. And that's great because a lot of people, I, I considered Sarah Charlie Parker. Mm -hmm. And she was with him. She was with Earl Hines mm -hmm. when I first heard her. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I don't know if she, well, she was very tight with Bill Epstein. Mm -hmm. So to me, it, I, was, I was with a female Charlie Parker. Mm -hmm. You know, some other people say, well, did it hurt you? Boom, boom, boom. We go another direction. I was with Bird, but I, I was a guy that I, I liked things. I wanted to have a house and the whole thing. You know, I, I dug material crap as well, you know. So when I went with Sarah, I worked steady. Mm -hmm. well, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't get rich, but I worked steady. And that's how I first got money to get a house. Because I had a car, I'm living in these hotels, I'm living up in Harlem, I'm living in different places. They start giving you tickets, different sides of the street, that whole thing. That's why I went to Queens, so I could have me a garage. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I had to play the game, it was a game of chess. So I'm saying the best of my ability. So uh, before I forget where I was or where I am, <laughs> you know, that's the whole thing. So, but with Sarah, man, it was not just playing with a singer. And this 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 lady, especially the period I was with her, man, it was. I used to go to work every night. <laughs> I can't tell you what I did on the bandstand. <laughs> tell me, right? <laughs> Larry really <t> <laughs> No, I mean, it was big fun. And I was wearing a tuxedo. It's the first time I had went to Europe. It was with Sarah Vaughan. They put my picture on the cover of Jazz Hot in Paris. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm with a singer, so they saw it different. But uh, it was until I played with Billy Holiday a while, too. The, Billy Holiday was Lester Young. Sarah Vaughan was Tyler Parker. Ella Fitzgerald was the Count Basie band. I played with three of those great singers. Next. <laughs> well, definitely, it's, it's pretty obvious that those, those three you named are not your anywhere near any run-of-the-mill singers. So, um, those are three giants who uh, uh, anybody would have been happy to play with then or now. But uh, you know, the that period now we're in the, the mid '50s. How long were you with Sarah? Five years. Five years. And uh, you said it was after that when you started family and all that? Um, uh, during. During well, that last period. I, I stayed from 53 to 58. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's, there's some family here. I'm not sure. We mentioned earlier uh, Roy's grandson, Marcus, is sitting back there. That's uh, Roy's daughter, Leslie's son. My son is here, too. My youngest son. And uh, Graham <laughs> is here somewhere right. over there. Graham Haynes. <laughs> Craig is not here, I don't believe, but... Uh, Craig is in China. Oh, is he? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so as Roy is talking about uh, this important things that are important to him at this time, not only playing the music, but buying a house, having material things, uh, these are things that, um, you know, we have to start thinking about at some point. It can't just all be fun um, all the time. And uh, uh, there are many musicians who have uh, put their focus on on uh, raising their families and making sure everything was cool at home, so to speak. And, uh, you know, Roy's obviously done that, and musicians following in his footsteps. Marcus is a, a fantastic drummer. I don't know if many of those of you know that. And Graham plays uh, trumpet, flugelhorn. Probably a lot of other things I don't know about. No, <laughs> um, uh, but Graham is busy writing music now. And writing, composing, <laughs> yes. And uh, these are beautiful things. Roy, I, if, if I can just add, I, I'm i uh, kind of getting my feet wet in that, in, those, in that realm. Now I have two daughters, teenage daughters, 16 and 13. Oh, uh, that's right. So you've so, been in there a few minutes. So I'm uh, oh, taking teenagers. all the gigs I can get. <laughs> girls. And they're pretty too. <laughs> yeah. I saw them somewhere. Yeah, they're pretty. Yeah. Um, you don't have to worry about no gigs though. Well, I hope not. I hope, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the things you're doing now. Um, 
and then we'll probably back uh, during the next half we're going to get some questions from the audience but I don't want to run out of too much time without talking about the present and not just staying in the past. Um, I'm sure all of you are aware that Roy has uh, turned 80 years old this year. Oh, and, uh, very young. 80 years young. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's really something to observe uh, for me, Roy. As I mentioned earlier, my father is about your age and born the year after you. Mm. And, um, but he doesn't have nearly the, the energy <laughs> that you have. But he's, uh, he's one of my heroes, too. But, um, you know, observing you and then um, I suppose it must sometimes occur to you that some of your, a lot of your peers are, are no longer here and, oh boy. and some of them are uh, physically incapacitated and unable to play anymore, uh, what have you. So um, I remember just recently when I was up at the, uh, the Zildjian Symbol Factory, they have a, a, a big poster in there of um, an event which took place not exactly sure of the year. It was called the American Drummers Award. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was Roy Haynes, Max Roach, Elvin Jones, um, Louis Belson, and, um, and Armin Zildjian was was there. The the son of Abbott Zildjian from the Zildjian family was there presenting the award. And when I looked at that poster, it, it was it kind of shocked me to think about the fact that uh, you know Elvin's gone. Uh, Max is not, not able to play anymore, and these kinds of things. I just wonder, you know, what kinds of thoughts might cross your mind knowing these, what's going on now, and where, you know. That, that that's a rough, the rough part right there. You know, when you think about it, when I went to, I guess it was last September, to Alvin's memorial, mm -hmm. it really affected me. And Max there in a wheelchair, you mm -hmm. know. That's the last time I saw him. But I understand that, uh, let's see, they had some awards, I forget what it was. The thing at Lincoln Center, I think it was. Oh, Somebody, a young oh, lady, right. mm -hmm. Roy daughter told me she was there, Max was there, and he looked good. Mm -hmm. you know, so I was glad to hear that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah the beat goes on. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Lauren, uh, are, we, are we okay on time? Is it, should we take a break about now? Or? Yeah. Because I think the second half is going to be pretty wild with all these people here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, we don't want to. Roy, actually. You know, how, how we, you feel, uh, we can just go on. Let's let's hit it. Let's keep moving. Keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless somebody got to run out or something, I'd rather just do it. And, you know. Okay. Well, since we're talking about the, the present moment, then uh, let's talk about <coughs> the group. Uh, you've been a band leader for many years now, at several different groups, mm -hmm, recorded please. under your own name many times, and. Um, now you have a group of musicians uh, quite young. Actually, they're probably young enough to be your grandsons, aren't they? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, when, uh, uh, Lewis, when we get on the bandstand now, or not only now, anytime, when we get on the bandstand, uh -huh. it's one. It's we all become the same age <laughs> at that time, and regardless, you know, it's it's a, it's, a, it's if it's real, it's a, it's a serious spiritual event. I'm not Absolutely. talking about this particular band. Right. All the bands, but this one especially, man, it, it's sometimes I can get on the bandstand and don't say anything, and uh, there'll be some magic happening. Mm -hmm. uh, they really, they, they're checking. Mm -hmm. Denzel Best used to always tell me years ago, play, play like it's the last time you're going to play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and especially now, you know, so many of my brothers are gone and right. everything. When I get on the bandstand, it's, it's a serious affair. Mm -hmm. It is, I mean, that's it. That is it. My religion. That's all I know. That's all I really want to do when I get there. Just go yeah. to sleep, ride my bike somewhere or something. But that's that's it. It's serious. Wow. No time for no, no time to wallow in the mire. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, baby, let's be <laughs> That's why he looks so good, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if that's it, but. <laughs> Roy, do you do any, besides playing the drums, any kind of the exercises that, uh, or anything like that to stay in shape, or is playing the drums enough? Mm. Well, sometimes I take long breaks now in between when I'm mm -hmm. just dying to get back. And this is a, a break. <laughs> Let's see, my last gig was in uh, University of Maryland. Saturday, I'm going to Vermont. Mm -hmm. I just try, I just think and, you know, mm -hmm. do a lot of that. I, mm -hmm. I don't do anything else mm -hmm. special. Mm -hmm. I used to ride my bike, but I haven't done that in a long time. I got a 10 speed for these legs and everything. But mm -hmm. 
uh, when I wake up, I feel feel like nothing, but get in the shower and just be thankful. And, hey, man, I feel good right now. Yeah. 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 audience questions but, uh, just before we do I want to remind everyone that Roy will be playing uh, is it next week at the Iridium the 11th the 11th through the 16th see who play with uh, his present group you want to tell us who's in the group no <laughs> find out for yourself next week <laughs> but they are young and they're uh, they inspire Roy so uh, that's good enough uh, if you can make it out to the Iridium next week. Um, where exactly? What's the Iridium's on Broadway? And, uh, I, I've been there, but uh, it's been a while. 51st. It used to be in a different location. Oh, yeah, I've time. It used to be on 60-something. 63rd. Now it's at the... Uh, I'm looking forward to going there. I'm looking forward to playing next week. So y'all better come down and inspire me. So we're, we're going to just take a five-minute intermission here and kind of right. let people get a... Uh, uh, I also want to thank everybody who came in late. Once again, I'm Lauren Schoenberg, the Executive Director of the Jazz Museum in Harlem, and on behalf of myself and Christian McBride and my board of directors, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight and sharing in this, in this wonderful night. A couple of small comments that we didn't make, we meant to make in the first half, which is, first of all, if you're taking photographs, please no uh, flashes. And we want to give primacy, frankly, to our museum uh, folks here, Nicole and Richard here, who are, who are archiving this for us. We are video recording this for the archives, non-commercial use only, for famous, the archives of the Jesuits. Famous last words. <laughs> and that's true. So all I can say is welcome back for the second half. Once again, we're humbled to have you here. And we are in the process of raising funds and things. I would like to mention that we do have a fundraising campaign go on. So as you leave tonight, we have little envelopes, and Wilhelmina will be with the uh, Jazz Museum box, which we'll pass around, because we are, frankly, struggling as we continue to make this thing happen. Also, volunteers, folks, come up and talk during the intermission about that they'd like to help. If you do want to come and help here, again, it's just me and Wilhelmina, that's it. Uh, feel free to let us know because we could really use you for a whole bunch of uh, different things. So I guess that's that's about covered. We're going to start with the questions. I'm going to make one re request as I look around the audience um, and I see so many folks who I know are going to have something to ask M Mr. Haynes only for the reason of time constraint. If you can make your question relatively short and concise and ask a question and, and let him answer it because sometimes it turns into a soapbox kind of thing. Frankly, so I'd, I'd like to start off with a question from Mr. Haynes, which is I, I interviewed you once on WBGO, and we kind of skirted around the topic. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about Lester Young, because the interviews that I've heard with him, I understand that he had a very strong philosophy about music and about life and the things he played. And I wonder if, again, for the folks of the future, if we could paint a little more of a picture about Lester Young and what he was like. And the second part of the question is, when you were playing with him, did he still Hold the saxophone up in the air. Uh, oh. Let's get to the saxophone first. I don't think he was holding it as high during that period. You know, because that was after the army, you know, after DB Blues and all of that. I was with him from 47 to 49. So there's some nights when he felt good, you know. But uh, he, he was, Monk reminded me a little of Lester Young. I don't know if you've ever been around Monk. They had their own way of talking, both of them. Prez, I mean, he, he'd hold a conversation. And you'd really have to be hip to what he was saying. You know, lots of times, I used to like with that black flat pork pie hat, and he had a black long coat. And he used to roll his socks down like that. He said, this little knot in his tie. I mean, he was a special guy. <laughs> and if he would see anybody, he always had his edis. Yeah, you know, anyone know what Zeris was? No. All y'all squares. Zeris <laughs> <laughs> was reserved. 
Anyhow, he went, <laughs> Edison, he used to drink gin. He used to have his own little glass with gin. Uh, we'd be like at a train station, and then he would say, ah, boom, that's what he used to talk. Like sand expression like that. Say this, Bob Crosby over there. Uh -oh. Bob Crosby was the cop. <laughs> he had a lot of other things, and he, he loved the ladies, and he was a special guy. He used to play a lot of records, a lot of singers, even Sinatra, you know. He was something, man. He was something. I enjoyed those two years because I was making $100 a week, paying your own hotel bill, and they were taking out tax. And I still enjoyed it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Right, when we were on the little intermission there, uh, some, some folks also were curious about any other reminis reminiscences about uh, Charlie Parker. A little, uh... You know what, I, I've been so fortunate to work with all of these people. and uh, I'm constantly getting calls to do interviews for all of them. Uh, all the time. And sometimes I run, I, I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Sure. As you can imagine. So sometimes it's hard. You know, yeah. you know, <laughs> when I start talking about uh, an incident, it's something that happened. And, you know. Mm -hmm. So what was your question again? I forgot, man. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of the people who, you know, for example, let's put it this way. Let's say a young person today goes to the video store, the DVD store or whatever, and they don't really know anything about the music. Uh, uh, so to speak, and they rent the movie Bird. They would not really get a good idea of what Charlie Parker was really like. So I guess, um, and there are some people in here who I'm sure do have a good idea, but there's some young musicians and people who, it's good for them to hear certain things from someone who was there. So I was just wondering if you might have any, even a short remembrance of, of an experience with Bird or something that you might want to share with them? Uh, I'm sure I do have a lot of them, but I can't, I can't think of uh, an appropriate one at this point. I got yeah. some really s serious ones. You know, <laughs> may not be good right now, especially since it's being documented, you know what I mean? Uh, Mr. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Haynes, um, oui. uh, about 10 years ago, as you recall, uh, I was part of a tribute to you on WBAI, and um, I remember you telling a story about Charlie Parker uh, how quick his mind was. So does that bring up anything? Because I remember you saying that, I don't know if you were in Paris or... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, you're talking about that, that documentary thing that, that I say something about it. I'd rather not go there again now. You know, no, I'm sure a lot of people have seen that, uh, what's that thing titled? It's a documentary where I talked about Bird would play this phrase from uh, this tune the last time I saw Paris. Yes. Um, and then, you know, I even sang it in, in the documentary, you know, I hummed it. Okay. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people were not even aware. There was one thing, see, when I get in situations like this, I don't want to start calling names, but we had a road manager for a while. It was a manager. He used to collect the money. Mm. And then I remember playing in Cleveland, Ohio. The name of the place was the Sky Bar, because we had to do matinees and everything there. When he would get the money, he would he would act like a little kid, and he would come grinning in front of the bandstand. And Charlie Parker, one time, went right into a, a tomb. Da 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 di da da da, ba do ba da di da da da, la bi da da di da da di da da da. Does anyone know the title of that? Scatterbrain. Scatterbrain. And he, what he was referring to the captain acting like scatterbrain. He didn't even know. That's how fast Charlie Parker was. I think maybe I was the only one on the bandstand that. Yeah, check that out too. Because I mean, he just played. He that's how fast he was. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, I'm sure we have some, uh, probably several questions. Uh, start here, Paul. Yeah. Uh, uh, stand up, and if they could enunciate. Mm -hmm. okay. Your um, career has spanned a lot of people. A lot of people who weren't born in in the '40s, such as myself, but know your music from the 50s. You talked about I'm Late. That's one of my favorite albums with right. Stan. And then I saw you with um, 
Chick Corea and Marisol Vito. So you played a lot of styles with a lot of people and stayed as fresh as tomorrow. Can you speak a little bit about that? Uh, uh, I think you said it, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> it speaks for itself. But, uh, you know, now we don't really have that much time, but thank you for paying attention and keeping me inspired. Mr. Haynes, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm wondering, how did you avoid the pitfalls that, uh, of, of drugs? That I was a strong, no guy. Right. <laughs> I, used have, I used to hang out with all with everybody, you know. So I'm thankful that uh, I did avoid, you know, certain things. You know, uh, when you this age, people have been uh, bugging me about writing a book, but which I, I'm really going to start to do, and, and I got to save some things for my book. Maybe if you guys don't buy it, your, your children may buy it. So I can't, I can't give everything out this way. You know, I got to save something. I was uh, in Europe, someplace, and uh, another drummer was hanging with me. I had to do an interview, and sometimes I don't, you know, I'm not into it, but when I get to talking, uh, the truth and different incidents, this drummer said to me, he said, you're not going to give out all your information, are you? You've been talking for an hour. So, next. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was just curious, you were talking about when you performing and there's a special hookup sometimes, a spirituality when you're playing with the right people in the right way. And I was wondering, can you comment at all on the audience? What, to, to what degree do you feel an audience out there and can, what, what degree is an audience a part of your performance? Audience is a lot because, first of all, we're on the handstand stage. We're giving it to each other and as a whole we're giving it to the audience. And we look for them to give us back something, and it works smoother that way. I know once I was playing uh, in uh, Spain, someplace at one of those big, you know, ten thousand people, and uh, I think it was Chick and uh, Joe Henderson. And during the performance, we got no action from the audience at all. And at the end of the when we played the last tune, they all stood up and they had a chant and they had a little they wrote, had cigarette lighters or matches and man it was some people just express themselves afterwards but sometimes if you can get it during the fact it, it, you know it helps you it really helps you but at the end i mean jesus christ you know <laughs> the party's over you know not, they want an encore now you know that's, that's, <laughs> i like it when it's back and forth if somebody shouts and says yeah, yeah i love it I don't have no questions. Uh, shout out, <laughs> can, I ride, can, can I ride a limo with you? <laughs> <laughs> can I ride a limo with you? I don't know who the limo that was when I came up with you. Give me a ride tonight. <laughs> you ain't driving? Well, You're hitchhiking, huh? We can talk Bill about Saxon, Bill Saxon used to play with me both. If, and, and Larry really, back in the day, we could, they could tell you some stories that I forgot about, I'm sure. <laughs> hey, uh, Larry. Uh, <laughs> I don't, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. What I want to say, I, I don't have a question, uh, but I want to make a statement that uh, my time playing with Roy Haynes is uh, one of the best times of my career. I learned more from him about music, you know, I played with a lot of people. I learned more from him about music and, and playing with the audience. He used to say, well, man, if I have a question about something, I play something that was questionable. Not questionable, like I wasn't sure. He said, well, don't let the people know that they know that you don't know. Well, they know as much as we know. <laughs> they never supposed to shoot. A lot of little things like that, among other things. But Roy, thank you very much. Oh, you know, welcome. He's thank like you my much. surrogate father, my family, my brother, my friend, sometimes my enemy. <laughs> no, <laughs> never, I, never hate I, you. I ain't never been no enemy. Well, I might take it that way. No. <laughs> I get sensitive no, sometimes. No, you ain't that sensitive. <laughs> Well, thank you, Roy. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, Roy, how you doing? Rome Neal here. Yeah. Now, I got this opportunity. I've been running after you to come to see the play Monk that I was in. Oh, you sure have. Numerous times. You sure have. And, I, you know, I forgot to take the time to ask you about the relationship with you and Monk. And at this forum, I think it's perfect. I can get my answer. <laughs> well, you know it was in the pocket, you know, it was cool. It's, he believed in me. And uh, 
I found out things later from uh, other drummers, you know, that, you know, so I was pretty sure he believed in it. He, and I, I loved it. I, because vice versa, you believed in him too to to hang with him. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I better, you know. Uh, yeah, at the five spot we were there for a long time and that's where I was working with my son my, my son was born, Graham. I was with, working with mom. So yes, my son was born on Mom's birthday, October tenth. Right? No, that's my grandson. Your grandson, right? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yes, no. So yeah. In Rome, you know, there's a quote, a quote of Monk talking about Roy. There's a quote of Monk talking about Roy's playing, and uh, it says, uh, Monk says, Roy Haynes' drumming is like an eight ball right in the side pocket. <laughs> so, uh, that's nice. Pretty clear. My name is Luther Gales. Um, I'm quite sure the generation that you grew up, or the older generation com uh, commented on your music and the, the music during that time. Could you comment on the popular music that's happened today, your insight on it? Oh, what do you say, popular music, what do you mean? Um, <laughs> Hip-hop. Hip-hop, and basically what, what the mass media is listening to as far as hip-hop and that commercial stuff that's coming across the radio. Uh, I, I don't know, I can't, I can't handle that. Uh -huh. But hip hop is some of the, some hip hop is hip, <laughs> and some is hop. That's that's jazz. Yeah, you know, you know, what the hell are you gonna say? <laughs> Let's make it fit. Mom's baby used to say, "If it don't fit, don't force it." <laughs> 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 Hi, sir. It's an honor and a pleasure. I'm Reggie. And I just wanted to ask uh, some questions about, um, you played with uh, John Coltrane on selfless, Selflessness, and also you, um, the Chick Corea session, um, Now He Sings, Now He Sobs, particularly the flat ride symbol. Was that an eight? I, there were small symbols. I, I, I don't, I didn't, I wasn't alive at that time, but, you know, was those small 18? I, so if you could talk about yeah it was it was uh, probably eighteen or something I forget exactly that was uh, a Pisces symbol a pi okay. and they used to crack they used to break they didn't la last long oh, okay. but uh, it was kind of interesting because people still talk about that I I still got flat rides I got uh, several ones but they're now Zildjian you know in fact what Chick Corea did he took one of the old Pisces that I used he took it to Zildjian and had them make copy it. Because Chick used to, when he had Return to Forever, he used to have all his drummers, when he played cues to piano, to play that cymbal. Because I know once I was listening to a record, I said, that sounds like my cymbal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got good ears. I mean, a lot, this is years ago. I said, man, that sounds... I said, I hear a lot of guys, that, I hear a little, play something that, that's related to me as well, not only the cymbal. <laughs> so, uh, not bad. I earn a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Someone else? A question for Roy? Yeah, where does he live now? He said he came to, he came to New York recently. Where is he living now? Is that a female asking where I live? <laughs> <laughs> I, I live on the island, and I, and I got a place in Vegas where I just come back from a couple of days ago. I got some thorns. I got those kind of yucca trees and all that, and the thorns go got in my leg. They didn't act like I want to come out. I mean, this time I got a lot of them. So, don't dare come back to that house. That's Las Vegas. Roy, I'd like to say something. Uh, I don't want to take up a lot of time because there's a lot of stories like you say that I can, can tell, but I'm saving them for my book, too. Uh, <laughs> but I learned a lot from Roy Haynes. Uh, Roy is one of the truly all-time great 
drummers, musicians, composers, human beings, he's a gentleman's quarterly, you name it. Roy has covered the whole gamut. One of the things I just want to point out real quick is how much I learned from you when we were on the road together because we did some, some beautiful things together. One time we took a, a bus all the way from New York to Los Angeles. Ooh. Greyhound. Ooh. Greyhound bus. And we got out there and Roy was hustling gigs. We worked at Shelly's Manhole. We worked uh, John T. McLean's The It Club. Because yeah. I ended up playing with Phineas Newborn out there too. And, and uh, Lawrence Marble. While we were off between it. And remember we played at the uh, at the theater. And, yeah, theater. And then one time we went to Detroit. Contract while I was there. That's right. We did it. We did the record was on the charts. That's <laughs> right. That was the album People. Yeah. Dick Bach. Yeah. And one time we went to Detroit. You remember we got out there <laughs> and the gig had been canceled. And Roy talked as Irving Hellman, this little dude who used to stand and was chomping on his cigar. Right. And uh, he, you talked him into saying, man, hey, look, we came all this way on the bus. Mm -hmm. no, we we had, I drove to Detroit that time. Did we drive? I think so. I don't think we took the bus then. Okay. Took the bus to California three days. Yeah, it took us three days. Bus. <laughs> Drinking cognac in the back. But Roy, just to show you how enterprising Roy is, uh, he talked the guy into letting us come in. It was the Drone Lounge, oh, Dexter sure. and Leslie. Oh, and uh, uh, Roy said, come on, we get together. And Roy always has a bunch of his people wherever we go. Uh, friends and, uh, and uh, fans and what have you, and we went to a place. You remember, and you had some flyers printed up. That's right. We went to the and printer. That's right. We went Bob to the printer, out. and we went all over Detroit, mm -hmm. all of us, passing out these these uh, flyers and everything. Mm -hmm. And we did good business for this man. He, in fact, he asked us back again. Yeah. Yeah. He was very impressed. Yeah. So there was a lot of a lot of stories that. Uh, Things we, I won't talk about West Peabody, but uh, oh, what's the good of ass? Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's that's memory. That that's true. I I could I could hustle back in those days. I had young children and all that, man. But yeah. something else I was going to say, you reminded me of. Let's get a call for your gig. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, uh, uh, we at uh, Shelly's Manhole. Um, what's the guy came in to see us? Um, I Spy, what's the guy? Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby. Cosby, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Memories. Chicago, right? you remember we had the Cats Hotel? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Memories. You know, the thing about that gig, that gig in Detroit that you were talking about, that was booked through one of the biggest booking agents. I think that was uh, William Morris. 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 That was a big agent. <laughs> and the guy that booked it never let me know that it was canceled. Gig is canceled. <laughs> and we go all the way to Detroit. Yeah. And luckily I knew what hotels to go to and that whole thing. Yeah. I had to go and hustle the gig back. Mm -hmm. You know it had to be for less money. <laughs> 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 but I did know a lot of people. I knew uh, all those sporting class, you know, the, the pimps. And, <laughs> you know. The gangsters, right. and I found out that they all most of the people love me, man. I found that out later. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a short story. I'm gonna leave it on. One time, I I needed some money, um, so this guy gives me the money. He's from Harlem. Mm -hmm. He gives me the money, and then I don't pay him back when I said I could pay him back. I had a gig that was advertised on the radio. It was down on the lower east side of my. Hatton, I think they call it the East Village now, but we call it the Low East Side back in the days. And so over the night, a lot of people there. This guy that owned the money, he comes up on the bandstand. He comes right up to the bandstand. Mm -mm. He says, Pat, he says, that was no gift, you know, and keeps walking. <laughs> and luckily, luckily that night, the place was packed. I mean, it was a lot of people there. I forget the guy that owned the place. Uh, Rafiki's. Does anyone remember Rafiki's? I think that's the name of the time. Anyhow, I gave the guys money. We all came up town to one of the bars on 7th Avenue. And I can't tell you the rest. So. 
<laughs> Everything was cool. How you doing, Mr. Haynes? Uh, I'm Jerome Jenny. I just wanted to ask you a question. Like, um, that band with John Coltrane in the 60s, with, with Elvin Jones, uh, Jimmy Garrison, and, and McCoy, um, when you when you played like on that album on 63 live at, at Newport and you did some other studio sessions, you know I guess something for Elvin. Like that band had a sound that Elvin had a big he, he had a big part in molding that sound. Mm -hmm. When they called you to to come in and play when when John when, when uh, Mr. Coltrane asked you to play, did you feel pressure to come out of a a, a different bag like? Did you did you feel pressure to sound kind of like Elvin but still do your thing too? Or I, I, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, <coughs> yeah, that's a good question. The, the, one of the big things behind that was well, the '60s was a hell, a hell of a period. Elvin was the guy for what Train was doing. Then. But uh, one of the secrets behind that, when I would go to Detroit, there was a place. Where are you from? Man? I knew it was somewhere out that way. <laughs> I had a feeling. I can't say I knew for sure. When I would go to Detroit, there was a place called a club called the Bluebird. And Alvin was working there. And I would always go there. And when I got there, I, would, I was playing the rest of the night. And it was always a tape recorder on. And we were related so much musically that a lot of people weren't aware of it because the way he was playing that not the same concept but it was definitely related it was loose it wasn't it was loose you know it was like this it could spread you know that's the way train described it mm. and so by us being related that was what that was about naturally i had to come up probably i still had some of the same small symbols small drums when i when i played with train you know uh let me just tell a short story I was once playing in Chicago, filling in for Elvin with coaching, and one of the writers, I don't think he's living now, he came to me after the set and says, Roy, I didn't know you could play like that. <laughs> and uh, that kind of offended me a little bit. So I jumped right on. I said, well, you should have asked Elvin. <laughs> <laughs> and what that guy did, that same guy, he's dead now. He called up John Coltrane. And John told me, because I mean, it was like a big secret. He's gonna call John up and then you know find out what's what. So John told me this guy asked him. Uh, so the way he asked John, so what's the difference between Roy Haynes and Alvin Jones? And Train explained that I guess somebody may have read it because they used that on, on notes and something. There was some records that I made with Train. I think there were two that had Alvin's name on them. One was Dale Stockholm. Then it was reissued later with my name. And it was titled to the beat of a different drum or something like that. I was on the chat. So things start coming to a head then. But he, you know, Alvin listened to everybody. In fact, <laughs> before Alvin came to New York, first of all, his brother introduced me to, introduced us at Cafe Society in the village just before he came to New York. He said, I want you to meet my young brother. So I was with Alfred Fitzgerald. Which brother? Which brother? Hank. 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 Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and what did Train say to the to the report? Well, you, they, that's still that's been in magazines. It's been uh, you got to find it somewhere. Oh, come on now. <laughs> he said a lot. I can't. I don't oh. know my word for word. Oh, he okay. said he he said he would always try to get me. Right. You know, if he needed somebody during a period when Alvin wasn't available. Okay. And he, he described the way we both have a way of spreading the rhythm. Those were his words. But he told me that the guy who called him up, you know, the guy was the one to be like secretive. And then another time, I don't know if it's the same guy, somebody interviewed El Elvin, and he kept saying, uh, the Roy Haynes, uh, what with you, and blah, blah, blah. He, like he was trying to break Elvin down, like the breaking up the family during the slave days, getting you to go at war with each other. And it wasn't about that. It was, you know, we were very close all the way, you know, and usually when he had an interview, and they would ask him his favorite drummers. I was one of the ones he would mention. Not only me, but he, he always he was a gracious person. So, um, hey. I was going to tell you something. I forget what the hell it was. I, I can't give it all out, though. 
I gotta save sound. I'd like to ask, uh, oh, is there another question over there? Oh, yes. And then the. Uh, All of the uh, musicians have been um, acknowledging what you've done for them. So, as a writer, I just wanted to say I wanted to thank you for everything that you've done for me. Kind of like took me under your wing, and as a writer, and you as a musician, and I like really appreciate that. And one thing I would like to say, one of the things that you um, first told me, and this is going back like maybe 20 years, um, I was talking to you and I wanted to do an interview and you said, well, we can do the interview tomorrow. This was after I thought you actually had a publicist and an agent and you told me you didn't have that and most jazz musicians didn't and you gave me your home phone number. I was like so excited. I'm like. I went home trying to think of people I could call and say, wow, I have Roy Haynes' home phone number. <laughs> <laughs> so the next morning I wake up, I was excited. I couldn't wait. I called you like at 10 a.m. Pick up the phone and you say, Ron Scott, the first thing you have to know is never call a jazz musician before 12 noon. <laughs> 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 I remember, yeah? So, like I said, I just, wa I just wanted to thank you for everything that you've done for me and for being a great friend. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Rob. <laughs> thank you for the great things you said about me in those people, man. Yeah. Wow. Ron's got <laughs> Thank you. Again, Roy. You are just great. I'm very glad to be here, and it's an honor and a pleasure. A little while ago, you were talking about Max Roach being the king uh, in the clubs in Brooklyn. No, nah, not uh, only in the clubs, just generally speaking. Yeah, the jazz clubs. <laughs> All right. Well, now, believe it or not, I just recently learned that there were a lot of jazz clubs in Brooklyn. I heard about Harlem, 52nd Street, but I was like really kind of surprised. I wasn't surprised, not really, but no one talks about these clubs in Brooklyn, oh, jazz yeah. clubs in particular. So I would like for you to kind of... Fill us in, educate us a little bit. Oh, Thank well, you. I can't give you too many of them now because I wasn't the king of Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they, they had uh, on Fulton Street. What's the name of the club on Fulton Street? Carnet. Uh, That's right. They, and Miles used to play every. There was a narrow little place, but the size size of this one, maybe not as big as this. And uh, they had uh, yeah. Turbo Village. Turbo Village. Yeah, I used to play the El Dante. That was down there, Ocean Parkway, somewhere with Sarah Vaughan. You don't want to come there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> oh, my God. Let's see, well, um, you know, Brooklyn was here. My wife was from Brooklyn. I married a Brooklyn lady. Yeah. Uh, my kids were born in the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Hospital. Yeah, man. Hey, hey uh, you still here, Graham? Yeah, man. Hey, you want to say anything about your father? That's about it. I don't. I can't say anything you didn't already say. But um, um, I might have some questions, though. <laughs> Don't, don't ask me no serious questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what, um, there's so, so many things that I could ask. I mean, musically, what, um, when you first came to New York, did you, um, did you encounter all the, the, the piano players? Everybody talks about the, cutting contests that used to go on with piano players in Harlem and all that. Can you, you remember any of that? Uh, that was a little before, that was a little before me. Uh, yeah, there was a, the place that's called St. Nick's Pub, that was owned by a guy named Lucky Roberts. That was Lucky's. That's one of the places where a lot of those cutting things used to go on. And then naturally some half dollar joints and all that, but, you know. Fat Swallow. Jimmy Russian told me once that uh, Fat Swallow would get him and have a suitcase full of whiskey. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, Jimmy Russian told me, I was going to take J Jimmy Russian. I always told him that. We played down at the 
at uh, what's the name of that place on Hudson Street? Half note. Uh, half note. Yeah. Yeah, I asked the company him down there, and he says, you said you're going to bring in a tech recorder, and I didn't. I was so hesitant about things like that. And he wanted me to get him to tell. He used to tell me about hanging out. Yeah. But those piano things, I think that was, well, that was the period of Bud Powell when uh, it, it, we'd, be, we'd be at Mittens, but, you know, it was a little different. It wouldn't be one piano play after the next. It would be, you know, I'm sorry I missed that one, though. Okay. Oh, we got a couple more. Yeah, we're Lauren Howard. Really short. It's, um, what was your relationship, if any, with uh, Art Blakey? Good question. Uh, I met Art. He, he was playing with Fletcher Henderson in Boston in the early 40s. I uh, may have been 44 or so around in that period. And he used to call me his son. I looked so young, you know, I, I never did know his exact age. <laughs> and when I did come to New York when I was with Louis Russell, there was a place on, uh, I think it was Atlantic Avenue called the Club Sudan. Bill Eckstein's band was playing there, and uh, Art Blakey was a drummer with the band at the time. They had dancing girls in that whole thing. So Art was, Art lived on 117th Street, I think it was. He would, we'd go by his house, and he'd get a, a hammer and a screwdriver and some tools and go down to a, a empty house. I should save this for my book. I don't think I'll finish it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we, yeah, we were cool. You ain't right. You ain't right at all. Next. All right, I, I, I think we, we need to start wrapping up soon, but we, we definitely have time for a few more. Uh, there was, I saw someone over here a minute ago. Isn't, isn't it? Uh, can you? Uh, yeah, thanks very much for coming. I just wanted to ask, can you say anything more about Harlem? You said it was amazing when you got here. Anything else? Maybe some places that are not so well known that you used to go to? Or just to some places that I used to go to? Yeah, not, maybe not to play, but just to hang. Oh, man. It was, well, 7th Avenue, they, uh, that's where Sugar Ray Robinson had a bar and a barber shop. Across the street from Sugar Ray Robinson's was uh, Shalimar, Red Randolph's place. And next door to Sugar Ray, uh, to Shalimar was a restaurant called Ma Frazier's. That was good food. I used to bump into Duke Ellington in there, or anybody in there. Sarah, Billy Holiday. Oh man. Smallest Paradise. Oh, Smallest Paradise. Uh, as far as 145th Street, there was a place called. Uh, uh, what was the place on 145th Street? In the old days, it was called uh, Hilda's 19th Hole. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you don't have to go there with that. Wow. 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 Uh, do you remember the, I'm not sure which period it was when Will Chamberlain owned that at one point, oh, right? Yeah. Early 60s. Yeah. Early 60s. Yeah. Wow. I remember way That's before that. Show, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Dan Cassell, and uh, because I was lucky enough to watch Joe Jones when he used to hang out at Eddie Condon's, he would take a newspaper and he would tap out rhythms that were of his own making. My question to you, when you were very young, did you create any special rhythms that you call your own and where would they have shown up in your music? Uh, well, could you answer that for me? <laughs> oh my gosh. You know some of the things I've tried to create. I, 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 that's too heavy for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, as a kid, you must have just played around with something. I, I love Papa Joe Jones, though. Uh -huh. uh, he, was, he was one of the first ones I listened to. So but just, uh, so I don't, it's, not, uh, it's not for me to say what things I created. You know, I'm not, I'm not that slick. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and Gloria, while we're, since we're talking about Joe Jones briefly, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off there, Lauren, but, you know, I, I had a chance to meet Joe Jones toward the end of his life. When I first came to New York, he was still playing at um, the West End Cafe in those days. It was in the late 70s. But um, I never really got to hear him in his heyday, except for on records. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what it's like as a drummer to watch and hear Joe Jones do his thing. Um, I've seen video footage, and it, for me, it's it's amazing how relaxed and uh, casual he looks in all of this music that's coming out of the drum. He looks like he's just sitting at the table having a conversation. Yes, sir. And he, um, I'm sure, had an effect on you the first time you saw him live or had a chance to to watch him do his thing. Well, he was so loose with what he was doing and. Uh, He's the first one I heard that uh, turned the beat around, so to speak. Mm. The way he used to play his hi-hat, uh, with that bassy, the All-American Rhythm Section. <laughs> you know, he's, he, he, that was his thing, hi-hat. The way he would hit the drums, the way he would draw the sound out of each of uh, the drums, mm. you know. Uh, I used to travel with that record of uh, Baby Dodds talking. I used to play that all the time. Mm -hmm. one spot in there, uh, Baby Dodds would say, anyone can beat a drum. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> play a drum. <laughs> beat a drum. And we got a lot of drum beaters out here today. <laughs> you know, some of that, you know, even the way they tune the drums today is, is don't even sound like a drum. What about the number of the Hmm? What about the number of the G's? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't want to go there. <laughs> yeah. Roy, could you talk about ca about calfskin heads back in the day when you started playing drums? And uh, calf well, calfskin, I remember breaking a, breaking a head in the 40s before all of these plastic drum heads were out. I mean, I, I remember being on the bus traveling wherever the hell we were at the time when I had a broken drum head. It, sometimes you try to patch them up. You can't do that with the plastic, but in old days we patch them up a little until we couldn't patch them anymore. And then that would mess the sound up as well when you start patching it. Mm -hmm. But uh, they said they, they saw a sheet of calfskin. Then you would have, what, uh, it's not called a hoop, the wooden part. What do you call that? <coughs> you had to tuck it yourself. You had to put that in. And that was, that was there was an art to doing that. And uh, then they started selling... Uh, the heads with the little wooden hoop inside already. The, the, the early days, man, it was it was it was, a, it was a hard for you. We we went to Mitten's Playhouse about a year and a half ago. You remember? Oh and yeah, 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 yeah. It was yeah. a very, and you said it was a very emotional thing. for it you. It was for me that yeah. And I'm wondering if you could talk about what Mitten's meant to you back then. Oh uh, man, that was, was that was like that was like like a home, you know, the warmth and the whole thing and. Sincerity, I just remember being there, jamming with Budfall the rest of the night. <laughs> People say there's a little fast young drummer from Boston that just got in town. <laughs> Babs Gonzalez in that whole period. That was an exciting period. Uh, isn't it after 8 o'clock? Okay, yeah. we got one more. Wasn't I supposed to go for 8? Wow. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> no. Wow. <laughs> My name is Al Balmer. I have European background, so I can tell you that those audiences that didn't clap or do anything while you were playing, that was out of respect. Oh, they, they, yes, were, they were cool at the end. The other thing I wanted to say was, did the older musicians from Boston, there were so many, like Johnny Hodges, Harry Carney, Charlie Holmes, and, and uh, Howard Johnson, did they look out for you when you came? Did you Boston guys hang out together? Let me tell you something. You couldn't get close to those guys in Duke Ellington's band. That was like, a, you couldn't get close. I didn't get close to Sonny Gray until, until I was 100. No, I mean, until I was much older. When I was working at McCall's a lot, he was living in the building. But you couldn't get, you couldn't get close to the guys in Duke's band. You know, Basics band, yeah. So, uh, Johnny Hodges, I don't ever remember talking to him. Harry Carney, I got kind of close to him late. That's because... His father went to my brother's church. You know, in fact, uh, yeah, he told me that. Uh, in 1952, when I was playing with Charlie Parker, we had a concert at Carnegie Hall, Duke Ellington's band. 
and Louis Belson had just married Pearl Bailey, and he was going on a honeymoon. He was leaving the band. They were going to Europe. And Joe Morgan was PR for Duke. And I was living downtown at the uh, President Hotel, which I think was 48th Street, across the street from Mama Leonis. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, I got a call from Duke to join the band. And I didn't jump because... I had experience with the big band, and, and I knew the situation that I would be presented with, with some of the older players in the band, you know, with my concept, what the way I wanted to do everything. Yeah, he could, he, he, I'm sure he, he was hip enough to ask me, but I would have had problems, so I didn't accept. And I used to bump into Duke at that same restaurant in Harlem, and he would always remind me that I didn't join the band in a, in a loving way, so I figured I was to some extent, I was flattered that the guy asked me, and he reacted. The last time I saw Duke, uh, I was in Washington, D.C., and uh, Johnson was president, and one of Johnson's secretary used to have parties at her place, and I was invited to the party. As I arrived, Duke Ellington was leaving, mm. and he still reminded me that I didn't <laughs> join him. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. Or, hey. Folks, don't quite leave yet. We have three more things to do, which we need your help doing. So the first is, if you, I'm going to grab this plaque, and we're going to present Mr. Haynes with our Jazz Museum in Harlem plaque. Wilhelmina, can you come up for the picture? And Greg and Lewis. And but stick around, because there's a surprise. <laughs> oh, so sweet, it was pathetic. Lewis, you should get it. So sweet. You must have given me eight cavities, but it was good. Can you hold it for me? Hold that cake up.